There we go. Okay, so that should pop up now just to say it's being recorded. Uh, so uh, welcome to our first Converge Evaluation Research Team research seminar for this academic year. It's great to have you all here. Uh, today, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Anil Bihal of Field and Graduate University, who's joining us from New York to explore the use of IPA in phenomenological research and analysis. Dr. Bihal holds a PhD in human and organizational development from the Field and Graduate University, Santa Barbara, California. Uh, his PhD research explored through the application of IPA, the fascinating concept of negative capability, first elaborated by Keats. And it's really fascinating sort of area of uh, research to, to dip into. It's very, very available online, so do, do have a look at it. It's fascinating. His research interests include hermeneutic phenomenology, critical phenomenology, uh, IPA, and grounded theory. He continues to be passionate about the application of IPA and has produced a number of explanatory videos available on YouTube exploring its application across a variety of fields. And again, I'd recommend you to, to have a look, research, you know, and find them. Uh, they're, they're available and fascinating. In addition to coaching doctoral students, Anil is also passionate about supporting them to convert their dissertations into accessible publications, which is always great as well to see, you know, you know valuable research, you know, be becoming accessible and being made available rather than uh, sitting on uh, library shelves somewhere. So uh, welcome, Dr. Bihal. Bihal, it's fabulous to have you here and with us today all the way from New York. So far, the technology is holding up. So I'll pass across to you. Thank Keeping you. my fingers and toes crossed. Thank you, Robert, uh, for that uh, warm introduction. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to be able to present this uh, IPA workshop. And I've got just a little something that I wrote to keep myself honest, right? Okay, and, and just to keep on track because I tend to go all over the place sometimes. <laughs> you know, if I get carried away into discussion, this thing is never going to end. We'll probably go on for hours. So hi, everyone, and welcome to this hour-long IPA workshop. IPA meaning the Interpretative Phenomenological Analysis Workshop. Uh, you can use, you either use interpretive or interpretative. doesn't matter. It's the same. It's the same. You know, we're just a different um, way of, of, of spelling it. I typically conduct this workshop in about 90 minutes to two hours. You know, usually that's how long it takes. So it's a challenge for me to compress this into an hour long session, but I'm gonna to try to do my best. Uh, we will have uh, uh, about the last 15 minutes devoted to Q and A. You're very welcome to either keep your questions to the very end, but as uh, my experience shows sometimes uh, when the session is in progress, you may have some questions and queries and stuff that come up. I would ask that you put them in the chat box. And if Robert uh, or someone else can keep an eye out on that, we're going to try to address them at the end of the seminar. Uh, if you're not able to address them, we can certainly go offline later and I can address them via email or whatever. We'll find a way to address those queries for you. Um, if you need to get in touch with me after the workshop for whatever reason, for to see clarification, if you're wanting some um, guidance in the use and deployment of IPA, you want to understand something about the nuances of using IPA, feel free to get in touch with me. You can either get my email uh, from uh, Robert, or I'm going to, in the last slide, I believe I have my email address. I'll show my email address to you. you could, you're very welcome to get in touch with me. So with that, Without further ado, let's get started. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Robert, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Is that okay? All right, great. So uh, let's go. Can everybody see this first slide? Yep, yep, I can okay. see it fine, thanks. Okay, excellent. So let me go to my next. So what is IPA? Uh, it's an acronym for interpretative phenomenology analysis or interpretive phenomenology analysis, whatever the case may be. It's not a methodology per se. I want to really emphasize here. A lot of times what happens is we researchers think of an approach to be a methodology, right? An approach is typically something that is under the rubric, under the umbrella of a methodology. 
So for instance, an action research methodology may have several different approaches of doing or, or, or deploying that methodology. So think of this as an approach to qualitative data analysis of a phenomenological nature. So if you see interpretative phenomenological analysis, IPA, that's the acronym that we use for that. It's not a methodology, but a turnkey approach. It's a step-by-step -step approach to conducting qualitative data analysis. So what do I mean? So when you are doing research, you have voluminous data, especially if you're doing qualitative research, the data is subjective. You're dealing with the thoughts, feelings, emotions, attitudes, perceptions of participants. So the data that is collected is really large. How do you then make sense of such a huge corpus of so much data? And that's always a challenge because, and that's one of the reasons why some people shy away from doing qualitative research. They'd rather stick with the quantitative research where the data is all numeric. So it's really hard to deal with non-numeric data. All right, and this data that we are talking about here is mostly non-numeric. It was developed by John in your backyard by Dr. Jonathan Smith and a team of health psychologists at the University of Birkbeck, UK. So I, I am really obligated to the honor Dr. Jonathan Smith for, uh, for, for not only since the uh, early to mid nineties developing this amazing approach to data analysis using a phenomenological approach, uh, but also um, giving me direction in my own doctoral research. When I was struggling to find a methodology that I could make sense of, really, that I could use as a novice researcher. So I'm really indebted to Dr. Smith and his team in the UK for giving us this opportunity. It's an in-depth approach to analyzing data and streams of consciousness in phenomenological studies. Now, what do I mean by streams of consciousness? Phenomenology, as you well know, is really typically not a methodology per se. Phenomenology is a philosophy of doing research. It's understanding the essence of a phenomenon. It's not, it's trying to make sense of what the participant means when they talk about such and such. And as we progress through the seminar, I'll share with you some examples of that. And the streams of consciousness are just, you know, and, and, and I hate to use the word rambling, but in a way it is reacting. The, the participant, when a participant is talking to you about a phenomena, sometimes they're just rambling. They're just sharing with you different thoughts and different dots out there. And your job as a researcher is to make sense of such disparate data, such disparate conversation. How do you then connect the dots from this maze of information that you get, all right? And it's all evocative because when you're dealing in phenomenology, you're talking about collecting thick data. Thick means voluminous data, rich data. You're not cutting the surface, right? You're going deep beneath, right? Because you're trying to get to the heart of that. It's pathos laden, right? It's not just simple emotions, it's deep emotions, all right? So we'll get into that uh, a little later. Uh, what is the focus of this presentation? So I just want to set the stage. I'm going to provide you with a quick overview of the theoretical underpinnings and pillars of IPA, okay? And when it should be deployed. So it's not IPA is one size fits all. Sometimes in research, we find that students first fall in love with a methodology or an approach and then go looking for a research question. Guys, it's the other way around. You first have to have a research question, which hopefully guides your methodology. So don't put the cart before the horse. Okay, but 
people have done that and I've, I've been guilty of that when I was doing my PhD. And really my faculty chair pulled me up and said, first find a research question and then we can talk about what methodology or what approach you might end up using. Um, it's an out, so outline dissertation topics. I'll share with you some quickly in the time allotted. We'll share some topics that are fertile for research doing phenomenology and <clears throat> using especially the IP approach. We'll craft some phenomenological research questions together, okay? And I'll share with you some questions and hopefully you should be able to uh, share with me at the end of this workshop, when we go for the Q&A segment, some of the topics or, or, or phenomena that you have in mind that you may feel could be fertile for using IPA. You can distinguish between whatness and thatness, we, and I'll talk about that, as they relate to research phenomena, all right? Uh, so let's look at, so let's dive right into research questions because that's really the meat of the seminar, okay? And what I want to share in this is how you can have the same phenomena but craft a different research questions and actually end up researching that phenomena differently using a different methodology, using a different approach. So just, let's just look for the sake of discussion at the first sample research question. What does engagement mean to employees? So if your research question is simply, what does engagement mean to employees? Under the features, you'll see that your focus is on engagement as an indirect employee experience. Now you do see, you can see my cursor, what does engagement mean to employees? So we are talking about certainly engagement, but we're also talking about employees, right? So focus is on engagement as an indirect employee experience. So the employees, we are simply asking the question, what does engagement mean to employees in general? So it's a very generic question, okay? The research phenomena clearly, if you look at the question, happens to be employee engagement, right? But the approach and our methodology that you may end up choosing for that is phenomenology. Why? Because you're looking at engagement as an indirect experience. Phenomenology is all about experience, experience, and experience. Okay, it's all experience laden. So when you're going for the experience a participant is having, the ideal approach, and I'm not suggesting that phenomenology is the only approach. You can have several other approaches. You can have discursive psychology, you can have narrative research, you can have a variety of methods, but phenomenology, as you will see, is a method that very closely approximates that question. So in phenomenology, we use transcendental phenomenology, which is kind of like some people used to use loosely pure phenomenology, which was uh, developed by or conceptualized by Husserl, Edmund Husserl in Germany, okay? He's known to be the father of phenomenology. Uh, and, he, and from his approach to phenomenology, his philosophy for phenomenology came through what we call descriptive phenomenology. And I'll make that distinction a little bit later in the seminar. But just think of it as descriptive, pure, idealistic, transcendental, it transcends the you, right? As you will see. So we are concentrating on the thatness of experience. What do I mean by thatness of experience? What, just look at the first question, what does engagement mean to employees? We are looking at an indirect way of perceiving that experience. So we are looking at how does that experience relate to employees or how do employees make sense of that experience? So it's kind of almost as though 
the experience you're researching is out there, right? That is generic. If you look at this question differently and we go down here, we reframe that question a little differently and we say, what is it like for employees to experience engagement in a virtual team? What is it like for employees to experience engagement in a virtual team? So in, <coughs> excuse me, in order to understand the essence of that experience relating to this question, we clearly have to have participants to interview qualitatively. And these participants have to be of necessity part of a virtual team, right? Okay. So if you notice the difference, the contrast between the first question here and the second question, you will suddenly see now we are bringing the direct lived experience of an employee. Now I'm trying to understand as a researcher what that experience means to that person who is part of a team. So who would I contact for interviewing? I would obviously have to contact employees who are engaged in that virtual team in a particular organization. So I may have an organization-wide research. Sometimes you do an organization-wide research, like the organization opens up the site that you can, because they want to understand what engagement means to the employees. Or you can have a mix. It depends on the context. It depends on your own study design. And we can discuss that a little later. So now if you talk about a direct lived experience, you suddenly find that the focus, look under the features column, you'll find that the focus now is on the personal meaning of engagement as a direct lived experience in a specific context. So now it's no longer generic. Now it's no longer outside of you. It's inside. It's experience. So the first one was experience as such. The second one is experience per se. Okay, so it brings in inside. So as such experience, as it relates to how I experience it as a member of a virtual team, not as describe the experience, but to anybody outside, if you ask them a question, what, do you, what does employee engagement mean to you? They can say what employee engagement means to them, but I'm not of necessity asking them to reflect on their own direct lived experience. And you'll hear the expression lived experience a lot in phenomenology, okay? So the focus is on personal meaning of engagement to this particular employee, to this particular participant. I'm interested in knowing what this participant feels and how this participant makes sense of draws meaning from that personal experience of engagement in, in, in working for a virtual organization. If you notice that the research phenomena has not changed, the research phenomena has remained the same, right? But the way we craft that research question puts us in a different direction. Now we are talking about using IPA, which is the subject of this seminar. And why are we using IPA? Because IPA is about direct lived experience. We are in IPA, you do not do generic studies. You do not use the transcendental descriptive approach. You're using a hermeneutic approach, interpretative. Hermeneutics is all about interpretation. So when we say IPA, interpretative phenomenological approach. So it's a hermeneutic approach to doing phenomenology. 
And here we are talking about the whatness of experience. What do we mean by that? It's a direct lived experience. If you notice in the last column, direct lived experience, which is ontological in nature. Ontology is the philosophy of being, is the nature of being. So we are trying to understand with the participants from the participants account, what is it like for you to be part of this virtual team experiencing engagement? Okay. All right. If you have any questions, please keep them at the end or put them in the chat box and we'll make sure that we feel them. All right. So let me go to the next slide. Focus of IPA. The focus of IPA is on the ontological nature of being. As in, what is it like to be gay? Or how does it make, how do you make sense of chronic lower back pain? Or what is it like for an unwed mother to be raising children in a single parent household? Or what is it like to suddenly discover that you have HIV, right? Or what is it like to experience dialysis for the very first time? So the, 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 the diversity in IPA is that you can actually end up researching a variety of different phenomena, not just health related, not just coming from the health sciences, but social science in general, okay? as long as it fits what we are talking about in IP, as long as it's a direct lived experience in a particular context. You just don't say, what is your lived experience and that, that there's no context. The context becomes important in this, okay? Because it throws in a whole new dimension into that. So IP is about meaning making and sense making as they relate to close, personal experiences, close and personal experiences, the experience that you are having as a mother, as a parent, as an employee, as a citizen, it doesn't matter what, but as long as the experience is close and personal. IPA analyzes thick emotional data, discursive accounts, rambling accounts, okay, evocative descriptions, and pathos-laden narratives or pathos-laden stories. You're trying as a researcher, and this is one of the hardest things when you're doing qualitative research of this nature. You have to have the capacity as a researcher to be extremely compassionate, to be able to connect not only with the feelings of others, but to be able to connect with your own feelings because this is a, an approach where reflexivity is a very, very important aspect of this. What is it doing to you as a researcher? How are you experiencing doing this research? Whereas in other studies, which are of a more quantitative nature or with their hands off, where the researcher is hands off, such as in ethnography, where you're going native into an organization to understand the organization's culture, the ethno. <laughs> So we analyze thick emotional discursive accounts, evocative descriptions and pathos laden narratives. It does not, and, and here please pay special attention to this last bullet point. IPA does not attempt to hypothesize, validate, refute, define, taxonomize or theorize. Now you might wonder, Okay, so I'm doing doctoral research and you're telling me that this is pre-theoretical, pre-reflective. So does theory not play any role? Am I just going to be doing my whole doctoral study over five years with no theory? I'm not saying that. Theory has an integral part. It has a very vital part, but theory comes later in your study and not sooner in your study. So what do I mean by that? So in IPA, we don't set up hypotheses, 
such as in quantitative research, we say hypothesis number one, hypothesis number two, hypothesis number three. And then you go and prove or disprove these hypotheses using a deductive approach. That is not what we are doing here. Our approach is inductive, all right? So forget about hypothesizing. You don't set up a hypothesis and you do go ahead and prove or disprove the hypothesis. You don't validate somebody's experience and say, hey, yeah, I'm also having that experience, right? That, that's, not your, that's not your job. You're just understanding their experience on its own terms, right? Um, so you're not validating, you're not into what is known as facticity. So if somebody says something to you and shares an experience and you say, mm, this guy is just, it's all bunk. It's, he's telling me all junk or she's telling me all junk. This is not true. You're not there to prove or disprove what somebody says. You have to treat every participant's experience on its own terms ideographically and with the sanctity that it deserves. It doesn't matter whether they're telling you the truth or they're not telling you the truth, but that truth or untruth, if there's such a word as untruth, has a relationship to their experience. And it is for you as a researcher, when you're analyzing data to try to make sense of what that person was saying without saying, oh my God, scummy person, right? He was telling me all truth. I may as well not have interviewed this guy or gal. That's not your job. Your job is to collect the data and then when you analyze the data, and if you find across your corpus or across your interviews, a number of people doing that, then you may have to go back to the drawing board and wonder, did I interview them correctly? Did I use the correct techniques to draw the information. Why are they saying stuff that seems totally out of norm? So you don't refute, you don't define, you don't ask a person, a, a participant, can you define emotional engagement to me? That's not the job. I know you sometimes people have a puzzled look. So what do you mean? So what's wrong with asking me to, def to ask a participant or as a researcher to ask a participant, please define the study phenomenon. You're not there to ask for a definition. You're there to draw their experience and how they are making sense of the experience, not how they define or how they put a spin on that. You don't taxonomize, you don't ask them, can you tell me axiomatically, right? One, two, three, four reasons why you think this way, this is correct, or why you think this is wrong? Or how, or how would you have one to 10, tell me 10 things that you feel about this. That's not the job. You don't ask them to put a taxonomy there. You don't ask them to theorize. So the moment you start an interview, you say, what, what, what theories do you think might govern what you're telling me? You're not going theoretical. It's a pre-theoretical endeavor. And I, as, as I go further into my, uh, my seminar, I'll share, you, share with you what I mean by that. IP is all about direct lived experience, direct lived experience. It is all about understanding the very essence of that experience, not defining, not describing, not taxonomizing, but the essence of that experience. And that sometimes is the hardest part for a researcher. Well, why, what was, Dr. Bell, what do you mean by an essence of an experience? Right? as it reveals itself to you as a researcher in its most primordial and originary forms. Primordial meaning going back, like old, ancient, to its origins, 
when you say originary, we use originary in um, phenomenology. We don't say original. Actually, they mean almost the same thing. But we use originary. It actually originary has been translated into English from the German, and I don't have that German expression. But this all comes from Husserl and Heidegger work. The researcher is trying to make sense of the experience as it is narrated by the participants. You do not stay outside of the bounds of that interview. You're just asking them questions. And of course you have an interview schedule and you have your prompts ready, right? But your job as the researcher is not that, oh, I'm gonna go axiomatically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 questions. It may well happen that in the interview, you may actually end up asking only eight questions. You may ask the sixth question first or the fifth question last. That really doesn't matter. The goal is not, it's not a quantitative approach, it's a qualitative study. It depends on what kind of relationship you've established, what kind of rapport you've established with a participant, how open and honest and forthcoming they are with the data, because what is your job? Your job is to be able to collect data because you're gonna need the data when you go into the analysis and the interpretation in the writing phase. So the question, the objective is not to validate or invalidate someone's experience. It is not to call into question the facticity. As I said, you're not there to prove or disprove the experience. That's not your job. It is a retrospective and this is a really important aspect. Sometimes people ask me, so um, Anil, why can I not? Why can I not ask an experience as it is happening? The here and now. So why can't I ask a participant, what experience are you having here and now? IPA is always a retrospective account, a past account. You're asking them to relive almost that experience thinking about that experience, whether that experience has been one year ago or one month ago or one week ago or 10 years ago, that doesn't matter. It has to be a retrospective account because you're asking them to reflect on that experience. And the important thing to understand is why does, why can you not have a question about what is it like for you to be in this here and now with me in the interview. So if I was asking Robert, Robert, can you tell me what you're experiencing right in this minute? Right? In this seminar, yes, yes. Granted, Robert can say, hey, this is what I felt, or whatever, this is what's going on. I'm disillusioned or distracted or whatever, right? But when you use phenomenology, the moment Robert starts to talk about his here and now experience, that experience has already slipped into the past. Because he cannot say right at this moment, this second, because there is no such thing as this second. It has already slipped into the past. So we are always working with experience that has happened in the past. Because we're trying to get rich evocative data. So we are looking at how did, so for instance, it's a, one phenomenologist, Max Manin wrote about his experience as a child walking through a forest. He loved to go into the forest with his father. They would walk and, and as they walked, it was autumn and the leaves were all dry, like all the leaves are dry in my yard, which reminds me I have to blow the leaves, <laughs> you know? And they're walking and then the, he hears the leaves, the little boy, Max Van Manen, who's now a very contemporary phenomenologist. He hears the leaves crackling under his feet and twigs cracking under his feet. And you know, nobody would really make any sense of that. But he said, dad, you know, there is a music to the sounds that I'm hearing. It's almost like there is a melody there. So that, that is not into phenomenology. And dad is asking, well, what, what are you trying to say? 
oh, just, you know, it's just the leaves. They're all dried and this. He said, Dad, you're only talking about the leaves that are dried and under my feet and they're crackling because I'm stamping on them. But I'm, list I'm hearing a melody. And so we are looking at a phenomenology IPA is a poetizing project. A daffodil to a horticulturalist is not the same as a daffodil to a poet. So it's a poetizing project. You're looking for poetic, something poetic, something, something novel in those descriptions, into the, in, the, in those narratives. So it's a retrospective past account I just wanted to share with you. In the time, we don't have that much time, otherwise I would have gone into so many other stories of how phenomenologists looking. If, you, if you've if you heard of uh, Simone de Bois' work, right? Uh, you heard of uh, Sartre's work, right? A being in nothingness, right? They, and you know, Sartre and, and, and Simone de Bois were life, almost life partners till the very end, but never got married, right? And both amazing phenomenologists. So I would highly encourage you to read some of that Jean-Paul Sartre, okay? And Simone de Bois' work. It's all on the internet, you can find that. Um, let me go further. Um, phenomenology, it's an understanding of the essence of a phenomena from the first person point of view. Okay, so in sometimes the, thing that you're going to run into in phenomenological studies is, uh, you know, your, and, your, and your faculty folks or your chair might say, hey, you're using too much first person. I did this. I recruited the participants. I found this. I found this impacting me. Why can't you say the researcher did this? The researcher recruited this. Remember, phenomenologies are written in the first person. Now, am I suggesting the entire study is going to be written in the first person? No, I'm not saying that. I'm seeing important segments of a phenomenology where you're narrating how an ex somebody's experience impacted you, whether you're talking about reflexivity, you're talking about making sense, interpreting data. You say, I did this. Okay. Now, if you're Chapter two in the literature review, when you're talking about conversations that were happening in the academy that you're bringing into your study in the form of a lit review, you're obviously talking about the third person, right? Because you're citing the work of other authors. Likewise, in later, in your final chapter, chapter five, which is implications, uh, findings, and future, whatever, uh, whatever, the, whichever way you word it, you bring in third person accounts, okay, because the curtains are now coming down on your study. But a lot of your study, a majority of your study, as a matter of fact, is written in the first person. You're introducing the reader in the first person. This is how I came about wanting to do this phenomenology or wanting to research this phenomena, et cetera, et cetera. So you bring in be, don't be afraid to bring in your first person account, okay? It is about intentionality. You'll hear the expression intentionality when we talk about major theorists such as Husserl, Heidegger, Sartre, and Schutz. Alfred Schutz was an American um, phenomenologist who worked with sociological phenomenology. And there are about 35 to 40 different phenomenology streams. The phenomenology of um, of uh, interpretation, the phenomenology from a feminist standpoint, the phenomenology, et cetera. So sociological, transcendental, descriptive, uh, hermeneutic, um, et cetera. So you can look up all that. Hermeneutics is of course the interpretation of text, be it written, verbal and nonverbal. You'll hear of Gadamer, Ricoeur, Delphi. Okay. Three phenomenologists uh, in this. Ideography, you'll hear the expression ideography and I'm coming to that uh, in a second. It's the understanding an individual's retrospective account. So you're going in ideography on their terms, in their words, you're not putting a spin on what they're saying, okay? 
uh, every individual is treated as a separate entity. And in the, in the, in the spirit of inductive approaches, where we are going from specific cases to a more general observation, okay? You're looking at the role of ideography being, being very important. Uh, how is IP different from other methods? Is it a step-by-step -step turnkey process, especially useful for novice researchers? When first researchers come into phenomenology, they find it to be a very convoluted approach. It's too many different ideas, right? Uh, too many different things. How do you connect those things? How do you connect those dots? How do you make sense of such disparate data? And one other expression that you're going to hear when you do IPA or phenomenology is a double or triple hermeneutic effect. In IPA studies, the researcher is making sense of a participant who's making sense of a phenomenon. What do I mean by that? So when I'm, I'm the researcher, I'm doing conducting a study in IPA using IPA, I'm asking Michelle, and Michelle is a participant, and I'm asking Michelle to make sense of a phenomena that I'm researching. Let's say I'm researching emotional abuse and battery. So the emotional abuse and battery is a phenomena that's out there. Michelle is looking at that phenomena and reflecting on that phenomena, telling me her experiences with that phenomena. And I'm asking Michelle to relate those experiences, narrate those experiences to me. So I'm making sense of how Michelle is making sense of a phenomenon. So there's a double hermeneutic, double interpretation. I'm interpreting partly what Michelle is saying to me about something that she's experiencing out there a phenomena that she's narrating to me. And what makes these, the water even more muddied in when the reader of a study, a reader of a phenomenological study is reading that study. So the reader is making sense of the researcher who wrote that dissertation, who's making sense of the participant, who's making sense of the phenomena. So you see how the triple hermeneutic comes in. So think of this, as interpretation happening in layers through different lenses. And that's what makes it so exciting. And it's not for everybody, okay? Some people are really unnerved by this. You know, they, they don't want to deal with so much abstract data, right? So I just understand that there is a double hermeneutic and a triple hermeneutic. It's important expressions when you're doing IPA or phenomenological studies. Interviewing and data collection, IPA uses very small corpuses typically. Jonathan Smith, uh, Larkins and Flowers, who wrote that book, Interpretative Phenomenological Analysis. It's on pdfdrive.net. If you want to go on pdfdrive.net, you can actually sign on and get literally hundreds and thousands of PDFs, whole books for free, okay? Um, you can download for your own use, of course, not to be disseminated. Um, but it, they say that theorists and these uh, guys, Jonathan Smith, Larkins and Flowers say that you can actually do an IPA with only two or three participants. Yes, that may be true for the very advanced researcher, but when you're doing a study and your doctoral student or a doctoral candidate, they're not gonna allow, they meaning your committee is not gonna allow you to do just three interviews. They're gonna want you to do at least 10 to 15, 15 being, 12 to 15 being the norm, okay? So emphasis on the co-creation of understanding and interpretation. So the emphasis here, unlike other research methods, is to co-create knowledge. That sounds like a very alien concept for people. How, what do you mean by co-creating knowledge? How is this knowledge being co-created? Because you are not, as a researcher, are not a hands-off researcher. You are engaging with them, with them meaning the participants, in a very intimate conversation. So there is a back and forth happening. You're paradoxically bilaterally connected to that participant. You're in a paradoxically bilateral relationship with that participant. 
and not and that does doesn't mean that you're steering the conversation in the direction that you of your own choosing it just means that you're really closely connected with them as your choice so in that sense you're co-creating knowledge and because you're co-creating knowledge your interpretation and that's why it's hermeneutic is the interpretative if you were doing descriptive phenomenology your role would be not involved in co-creation. You just report whatever you received and allow the reader to make an interpretation. Huge difference there, right? Um, both playing an active role in the study, structured and in-depth interviews, researcher assumes a hands-on paradoxically bilateral relationship, which I just shared with you. Uh, interpretation and sense making have already begun in the data collection phase of the study. So as you're collecting data, you're already somewhat interpreting it. But you're in, even though the sense making process, how can you not be making sense, right? As you're talking to somebody, the sense making process has already started in your mind. However, and here is the interesting thing in phenomenology. What you're doing is you are bracketing, and I'm going to come to bracketing in a second. IPA deploys inductive reasoning, so I'm going to skip through that. Philosophically inductive reasoning, reasoning is more nuanced and uncertain. It does not attempt to prove this group. Some of the repeat of what I was saying. It's a hermeneutics of description and suspicion. So you ask them to describe the experience, but also lurking beneath that are questions that they are not answering for you. So there is a hermeneutics interpretation of suspicion. What are you seeing lurking in the background that they're not talking about, which you interpret in your final analysis? Uh, pays attention to what lies beneath the surface, what is not being said. So researchers' assumptions, preconceived notions, and paradigmatic lenses as they relate to the study phenomena are important factors. For the purpose of research, research, your own biases, preconceived notions, ideas, suppositions have to be bracketed. What do I mean by that? You set them aside. Can you humanly set aside all your biases, preconceived notions? No, you cannot. But for the sake of the study, in order to collect authentic good data, you set them aside. You put them aside in a bracket. And then later, when you talk about reflexivity, that's when you bring in what you had bracketed earlier. But for the purpose of collecting data, analyzing data, you bracket your experiences, your own. So I may have a lot to say. As a matter of fact, when I started doing my study in negative capability, I was just so drawn to the work of Keats. I was not a aesthetic in any way. I was not a poet. I was not into poetry. I loved William Shakespeare, but I started to read and I saw papers written by Robert French at the University, I forget, University of West of England, I would want to say. He's now retired. He wrote a brilliant paper on IPA, or not on IPA, but on negative capability. And I was so drawn to that because it was an oxymoron, negative and capability. How can they two jive? But what he meant by negative capability or what Keats meant by negative capability is the capacity to be in mysteries, doubts, and uncertainties without irritably reaching out to factor reason. To remain in that state of knowing and not knowing, to remain in that liminal state of mind. But I don't want to digress, okay? So that's how really I started to think of the novel concept and I used IPA to, to research that. So while the researcher consciously brackets, et cetera, in this way, IP is a unique and novel approach to studying phenomena. The next slide cover the interpretation. Now here, this slide is a very populated slide. We are not going to have the time, Robert, to go through this entire thing. So I would urge the wonderful participants here in this, that if anybody wants this, um, wants my PowerPoint, please write to me personally, or if you want to, uh, have me help you with something, uh, I can certainly you know, go over all that because it's a populated slide. It's, a, it's really the process of how do you, after having collected all this huge data, how do you then analyze it? So I've broken it down into six stages of analysis. 
That's why I call it a turnkey process. I made the process very simple. A process that actually is very complex. I've tried to make it sim simplified for researchers and my students. Um, so please write to me on that. Then phenomenological writing. Um, uh, you know, and, and writing is about 60 to 70% of the total task, okay? You may have collected wonderful data. You may have tried to analyze the data, but what about writing about it? How do you, how do you describe? How do you make sense of in writing? That's where the rubber meets the road, really, okay? And that's where some people really falter when they're not able to express those what they've collected in writing. Because a study is worthless, really, if you've not been able to write, write about it in, 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 a, in, a, in an academic way, in a scholarly way, okay? Not just in a colloquial storytelling type of way. And that's always the challenge. So um, this is my last slide. Um, my email address is right up top there. You can take a screenshot of that um, if you like. And now at this point, we can open it up for q and Is that okay, uh, Robert? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, okay. Anil. Uh, so there were a few questions uh, posted into the chat as, uh, as okay. you went through the presentation. Sure. Uh, we've got a, a few minutes, I think, um, mm -hmm. want to have a look through those. So we had started with... Um, Reflexivity, do you mean it's the extent to which a person reflects back and shares her or his personal experience? You got it. That's right. Right on the button. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Uh, then if several people did, as you say, when you were talking about them lying in their interviews, yes. uh, wouldn't yes. that be a valuable research finding in itself? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that's what I mentioned when I was talking about that. You have to wonder why so many people are lying or why you think they're lying. In their mind, they may not be lying, but you think they're lying because you, it's a, 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 you're going by the universal meaning of truth and untruth. Yeah. But they may have a different nuance to that. Right? It, I mean, that's a great example as well of double, double hermeneutics, I guess. So there you go. Uh, yeah. And you remember when we were talking about the hermeneutics of suspicion and hermeneutics of description? So one is the thing that they're describing under that lurking is this your suspicion that they may not be telling the truth. So yes, Fabulous. that is true. Anything else there? Uh, the so chat? how is grounded theory different from IPA studies? Oh, beautiful. You just got me started when the thing <laughs> is ending. Oh God, don't ask me all these wonderful questions. So both, both approaches are as you well know, um, phenomenology and grounded theory are both inductive. But in the, the difference is that even though they're both inductive approaches, the one is heavily theoretical, which is grounded theory, right? Because you, start, you can have a hypothesis there because the role of grounded theory is to either construct a new theory, right? Or, to understand the efficacy of an existing theory, to question the relevance or efficacy of an existing theory. So it's, the, it's, a, it's a heavily, it is a longer project, a more arduous process, process of doing research. It can take so, so both, but both are absolutely amazing. They have a, a lot of commonality there because they both have phenomena that they work with. They both have emergent themes that you're working with. You both have superordinate, subordinate themes, but that's where the difference ends. The, it's quite different approaches. Anything else there? Okay, uh, we've got a, a question from Mathilde, uh, who's an existential psychotherapist by trade. Uh, mm -hmm. On a phenomenological MRES, uh, so Masters by Research, I guess, on alchemy and drawing, my question is how can we make sure uh, or slash train whoever is doing a phenomenological research mm -hmm. to be actually trained in understanding their self and can work at a deep inner relational depth and warmth in order to really connect with the participants. Ah, so you, in a sense, we are talking about, um, and I, I I don't want to read too much into it, but I, yeah. it, the thought that comes to my mind is the therapeutic alliance, 
mm. to form some sort of a therapeutic connection and alliance where there's a an atmosphere of trust and safety that's that's created. Mm. Uh, but that's it's it would be beyond the scope of this conversation to go too deep into that. But I'd love to take Matilde's question later. After mm. that, if she feels, I, I'd be happy to share some resources that I may have on that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Again, it's sort of digging into that double hermeneutic, isn't it? And, yeah. you know, trying to, I don't know, is it a process of trying to overcome that and the, you know, the influence of yourself upon your interpretation of mm. another person's meaning? Yeah. It's so, also so, and, awareness, isn't it? How aware right. we are actually of what is going on with us so that we can recognize whatever is going on with somebody else and our participants. Mm. Absolutely. But becoming aware of ourselves can sometimes impeach uh, or, uh, or impinge on the process of the interpretation. So becoming aware is one thing, but to be able to then consciously bracket that awareness for the sake of the research, for you go mm -hmm. down and then you explore that in your final interpretation and writing. But that's an excellent point. I really appreciate that, yeah. And that can be sometimes a really hard, a, a very challenging thing for researchers to do. How do you set aside your biases, assumptions, suppositions about that and allow the data to just emerge? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It's certainly something, you know, a question that I often stumble on uh, mm -hmm. And it's a, a very much a personal sort of rabbit hole that I can sort of disappear down into <laughs> and risk yes. never emerging from. So correct. Um, correct. We, we've in previous seminars we've had uh, people who've explored the use of uh, very creative uh, data collection techniques, uh -huh. and uh, my question to them has been in the past about interpreting those products of the research mm -hmm. process. So it might be a piece of poetry or a piece of artwork. Mm -hmm. uh, and the response often has been that the the product stands on its own um, and mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily need, you know, the interpretation of another person. You know, it, it exists. As uh, uh, the, and so what you're really describing almost is the descriptive phenomenology mm -hmm. of, yeah. um, you know, the, the, that approach that has been used by uh, some recent contemporary phenomenologists using a descriptive lens, mm. whereas where, where you've collected the data, you've done all of the stuff that you would do in an IPA, mm. but then at the interpretative, you do not interpret that. Mm. You only describe it and say, this is what I, what was shared with me. Yeah. Right. But you do not then go ahead and put your own spin on it. Mm. using your own lenses you're using your own theoretical framework on that mm. yeah <laughs> so, so it's, very, it's 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 yeah. quite a challenge yeah yes yeah i mean it's a very yeah. interesting um difference i guess isn't it so yeah. yes yes um uh, and 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 again the and, and and by the way descriptive and hermeneutic both have their own pros and cons right right because you know it's one it's just not one size fits all sometimes a phenomena is best observed or best analyzed from the standpoint of descriptive so when i say even when i say analyze i'm meaning interpreting interpreted but when i say analysis in the in terms of descriptive and uh, phenomenology i'm just saying essentially you are like a detective you're just sharing what you saw in the field mm. right you're not making your own um, own analyses of it. You're allowing the reader to form their own mm. opinions or whatever on that. Yes, Komal, yeah. did you have a question? Quick question on that? Yeah, I just want to like uh, cross check once if I'm getting it right or not. So as you yeah. said, like while we are collecting data, we need to bracket the data as well as you, you can't like pre there should be no preconceived notions that you yes. had from your own from your own life but i mm. have a question that when you're actually analyzing the data and when you're actually writing it down and then you're analyzing it so the, even then we need to bracket our own experiences or we can yeah. just 
relate okay. while we're... Uh, and, and that's that's a super question. That's a really nice question because what do you then do with all the bracketing that you did previously, right? Yeah. You just, yes. just, just dump it? No. Yeah. Then you bring that back in, but the art, the masterful research art there is how do you then talk about what you bracketed? And I'm going to take the example of assumptions because every study you make an assumption you assume okay. about such and such about the phenomena and then you yeah. say in the reflexivity part were your assumptions correct or were you totally off base right? yes yeah did you assume wrong yes. and so that discussion comes under reflexivity okay, okay. so you so the the art the skill lies in how do you not let the boundaries get blurred because when in a study you have to be very explicit about what is it that you were experiencing reflexively, reflexively. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't even get the word. Re reflexively, or uh, reflexively. Okay, I finally got it. Reflexively. Yes, <laughs> it's such a tongue twister. So, yeah. um, how how do you so so to separate that? Um, but Komal, I can talk to you about that. Yeah, after no that, way. just in the interest of the boundary, time boundary. Okay. I That's want to be right. respectful of that, okay? Um, but you can certainly talk to me about that later. Yes, right? absolutely. Thank you, anyway. Thank you, sir. Sure, sure. Brilliant. Uh, certainly, I mean that that makes uh, for me that 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 really sort of brings in a very active reflexivity into yes. the research process, and often reflexivity yes. can sit alone uh, and is seen as a, a process that people go through, but actually, mm -hmm. it's drawing it into that interpretation and. Well, helping you to engage in that interpretive process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. brilliant i'm just aware of time uh we, we're just over over the hour but uh i'd like to to express my thanks um for dr behal for joining us today uh, all the way uh, from new york um and thank you also for for being here and taking part in the the seminar today i know for for some of you it uh is either been a very early morning or a very late night. Uh, so thank you very much for, for taking the effort for joining us. Uh, just a quick word uh, about our next seminar. So on the 6th of December at 1 p.m., an hour earlier uh, than today, we've got Professor Stephen Clift joining us, who will be leading a seminar exploring the role of singing and uh, mental health. Uh, so that's coming up on the 6th of December. I will be sending out publicity for that uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks, I guess. So you should you should see uh, information about that coming through. Just a very big thank you for Dr. Bihal uh, for joining us today. It's been a fabulous and very evocative uh, introduction to IPA. Uh, and certainly it's um, opened my eyes to it. And you know I can see some real, real benefits of its application in research. So. Thank you very much and thank you for your comments and questions today. Yeah, okay. thank you all for your wonderful comments. I just had a quick look through all the comments that Robert had read from the chat. And again, uh, my, uh, my email address is right there. If you feel free to get in touch, if you want to bounce some ideas off of me, if you have some questions, mm -hmm. concerns, observations, feel free, all right? And yep. thanks again for your time. I'm sorry we went a little bit over time, but, this tends to happen. This yeah. is actually the fastest one I've done, as Kobal will tell you. My mine runs into two hours, and then we cannot stop. <laughs> yeah. Literally, somebody has to hit me on the head and yeah. say, let's stop now. All right. Thanks so, again. Thank you. And so Robert, I do uh, have the video it. of the seminar. So if people would like to sort of revisit it, uh, drop me an email, and I can share that with you. And uh, Dr. Bihar, if you're happy to share your slides, then I, I can also distribute those. Uh, oh, absolutely. I, I, I'm i going to send that. And I also sent you the link to my paper on SAGE on IPA. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll try to dig up some other resources and send you links to those as well, um, which, which should be helpful to people uh, as they progress through their own research journeys. Mm. All right. Thanks again. So Thank you very much. I'm going to sign off now. Great. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care. Have a good night. Bye, okay. everyone. Bye.